So thank you so much, Marie and Philip, for inviting me here today. I'm really delighted to be exploring your new art piece, Yes, But Do You Care? So Marie, you're the lead artist who developed the project and invited Philip with the Dementia Carers Campaign Network to join you in making this new piece. Can I just ask you one or two questions about the piece itself, starting with um, what this is about and what inspired you to make it at this particular point in time? Um, thanks, Tara. I, the work's about, um, I suppose, some of the complexity of capacity um, and, and the idea of um, a person's personal autonomy and dependency. And so this idea of interdependency in relation to capacity. Um, and it's particularly through a dementia care lens. So, and carer as in family home carer. Um, and the, the work pivots around this idea that through new legislation in Ireland, everyone has the right to make a bad decision. The Law Society did a really interesting conference while I was at residence in IMA and they basically were looking at um, this new capacity legislation and they were talking about balancing um, rights and the practical realities. And I thought this is, this is interesting. So I went along and I got really inspired in terms of the complexity of the legislation from a human rights perspective of giving someone living with a dementia the right to make a bad decision. But the subtext of that is what, what might that mean for a carer? And, and I'm really interested in this kind of behind the scenes kind of hidden worlds of people's lived life experience. And I thought I'd really like to find out more about this territory, but both from the kind of public side of the legislation and then from the maybe more behind the scenes um, side. Um, so I met different um, members of staff up at St. James's Hospital in Dublin and the Mercy's um, Institute for Successful Ageing and with different people who are sort of specialist in terms of the legislation. So I went up to Galway University and spoke to a professor of law there who'd kind of contributed to the capacity legislation. And then I um, went back to the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland, who I'd collaborated with previously and said, are you interested in principle in working with me to um, develop ideas with carers? And they said, yeah, we'd love to. And so I linked in with the Dementia Carers Campaign Network. I really wanted to work with um, Philip again. So that was, that was why I went to Philip and said, you know, are you interested in this, in these kind of ideas and potentially um, charting a new piece of work, looking at this um, sense of capacity, autonomy and dependency. Okay, wow, yeah. So it is very timely and there's so many angles you could probably come at this from, but I wanted you to talk a little bit about what is involved in the work. Um, and what we might experience, you know, as an audience member. But uh, maybe just before you do that, what you talked about the networks that you con connected into to to get this work made, even though it's still being made. Um, but what kind of research have you been doing to to make sure that you really have a grasp of the situation, so you can actually project your own view on it? I think um, it's been threefold. So I've been meeting with um, dementia carers across the country. So I've been very much um, inviting them into a conversation that's saying, could you tell me about your day-to-day -day experience of caring for someone? And how do you see um, the potential for the new capacity legislation to interface with your day-to-day -day experiences? And then the other side, I've been um, talking to um, two key people who know a lot about the legislation and capacity specifically, and, and the idea that capacity isn't a static thing, not something that's black or white. You might have more capacity one day than another day. So it's been, I suppose, really interesting looking at, um, as some people describe the inflexibility of the law. This isn't what I'm saying, but this is what I'm learning, talking with people. And then the massive, um, I suppose, complexity of um, living and supporting and loving a person who has um, different stages of a dementia. So, and the interface of the two, and then the wider framing is, is working with um, human rights advocates who would basically be campaigning for people's rights um, in, a, in a, I suppose, um, societal way, as opposed to the Dementia Carers Campaign Network that would be campaigning from a lived life experience. So it's been, I suppose, charting the, that landscape from different perspectives so that it, it shifted and, and continues to shift from lived life experience into creating an art piece if that makes sense Tara yeah for sure but yeah but just the more you listen to you describe it the, uh, I mean obviously it's a very sensitive area of work in general but there's so many different components to it but um 
I might just turn to you for uh, a few minutes, Philip. Um, what I wanted to ask you was, um, have you worked much before this in an interdisciplinary way? Or I don't know, or what, maybe you consider this multidisciplinary rather than interdisciplinary. Maybe you could comment on that. But And then also, is this the first time you might have worked with Marie? Generally, the work I would do uh, is, in a, you know, to kind of make theatre and dance. Uh, you have to have a work with a big team of creatives and collaborators. So I'm quite used to working, collaborating with people um, from various disciplines. And it's always different and it's always uh, very, very interesting. Um, I had responded to a piece of work that uh, Marie made. I think maybe Marie, you can, is it 2016? Was it 2015, 2016? Uh, it seems like yesterday, a piece that, uh, a work that she made called Egress. And, um, uh, and I had kind of responded to it uh, through dance once the piece was made. And actually it was very interesting because based on that work, I, it kind of, it touched on, uh, it was dealing with themes of, of, of dementia and, you know, loss of memory and loss of um, uh, faculties. And um, I was beginning a journey with my mother at the time with her own dementia and, 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 and being a carer. And it went, that led to my own work over the past few years, delving further into that. So it's really nice because that was also personal. So to, to then have the opportunity to uh, work with uh, Marie um, to uh, just kind of get a more global sense of the picture as well. Can I just tease it out a bit more in terms of working with Marie? Um, I don't know if you've worked with a visual artist much before, but I wondered, was there any sense that you were coming at it in different ways? coming at the the issues the area the emotions at it was there any any sense of difference that could have ended up being obviously really creative or was there a seamless kind of approach aesthetic approach well Mar <laughs> even though she's here Marie is very easy to work with so we, we have a good working relationship I think and uh we're very easy you know the communication was very easy but I think whenever you're working with an artist of a different genre. There's a language, there's a, a language um, that you have to bridge, you know what I mean? Just the way you, uh, you know, communicate things. And, and so meeting in the middle was actually very easy, but it was also very interesting. It was just to think from a visual artist perspective, the way she sees the world and coming from a very physical perspective, the way I would approach it. Um, was it's it's a really great journey. It's a really it's a really nice thing to um, to experience. So yeah, you have to take that on. It's an important part of it, I suppose. Okay, um, and I also wanted to ask you, as I think lots of people who are watching this will be thinking, how is this happening in lockdown, and how have you been managing to do it? What strategies other than this Zoom? What have you been doing? Well, it was the first time, I think, I don't know about Marie, but it was the first time that I kind of rehearsed on Zoom. So Marie was in Cork and I was in Dublin. And that was really crazy because, you know, we were kind of looking at this material that we were to work with. And then um, I was physically working on stuff and then Marie was watching it and there was a back and forth. But it was also on the screen so it's like if I'm further here trying to kind of trying to trying to dance and then kind of stopping and running back and going what did you think of that and then running back and so really crazy but also you know you you do what we do whatever we can to 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 make work and 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 within that I suppose you find find interesting pathways. I think for me because we we originally perceived it as a live event and then we kind of mutated um, because of COVID into thinking, OK, it'll be kind of digital. And so we began to think of it through um, the lens. And now, ironically, we've gone back to a live event. But for me, when you were um, working on Zoom in the studio, I could then see it as I can, as I, you know, because I make films. So I could see it 
as a two-dimensional object moving through space on a lens. And that was really, that was a pivotal moment for me because I could say, okay, we've really got to think about this sense of, because I'm, I'm not a dancer, you know, it's like, and so as, as Philip would be saying, I'd be kind of, you know, talking about things and showing Philip images and we'd be brainstorming, but then it really came into movement, it came, it came to make a movement in my head when I saw Philip then moving through space in an environment on the screen. So that was really helpful. I think that was a really, like, it was, it was a break for us really that we were doing it practically, weren't we? Um, because we had to, we, we both elected, we we're gonna progress the work, but seeing it two dimensionally was very helpful. And then when we went back into Wimmer and did it in the People's Pavilion, that was another massive shift for me to then think, okay, I've got to think three dimensionally again, what, what does this mean? And the work shifts massively from looking at it as a two dimensional with Philip moving through space on the screen and then thinking, okay, I, I can stand anywhere and he can move around me. So that was some, um, there were two pivotal moments for me, all both to do with, with kind of COVID. What about you, Philip? Cause you, you, I think you were going to say something. Yes. For me, I initially found it very, very difficult uh, on Zoom. Uh, but I think because of the distance and because of the computer, it, requ it, it required a clarity of um, between both of us of, 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 of kind of setting a structure and how we would, we would work together that actually by the time we came together in a physical space, it was so easy, you know, by, by comparison. Um, and maybe if you could tell me both, how how is someone going to encounter this work now? What, like, what what are they actually going to see or experience? So this this work is a documentation of a live event that we've just just recently done, and and there's five elements. So Philip's a central um, performer, um, and then there's four other actors who are speaking. Um, so they've got spoken word passages, um, but they're embodying them as well. And then, but we felt because um, we were going to go back into a, um, a site to respond to the site would, would make sense. So there's, um, in terms of what the audience see, there's um, a, a big salt drawing. So it's a ground drawing that Philip then interacts with. So we, I suppose salt, you know, it's got this whole kind of metaphor and we could kind of talk about that later on, but the, the physicality of the salt was important as well as the drawn element. Um, and then we were working with a load of sticks. So there's a sort of symbolism about sticks um, and then Philip interacts and moves with these sticks. Um, and then we've got projected stills and video. Um, and then we've got um, this huge site. So we, we're responding to the site in as much as um, one, one aspect of the performance is in this massive, massive fridge. Um, and then another aspect is in this big, um, it's like a huge wooden structure. So it's almost for me, it's like referencing like a dwelling, like a dwelling house um, that, that Philip is inhabiting. Um, so I suppose there's these five different components to the work. Um, and then the performers animating and moving through those different elements to document that as best we could, enabling the audience to get a sense of the, the, the viscerality of, of being in a space in, in time with a series of objects. Um, that the performers are, are altering through time, we felt was um, the best way forward for the work to go back to that live element, even though people couldn't physically be in the space. So they'll be, they'll be looking at a film of the live event. And maybe this is a question actually for, for you, Philip, because you're a performer as well as a choreographer, but how do you think people experience something in front of a screen, you know, like this documentation of the live event versus in in live, in person, what do you think are the different, how would you describe the difference in the experience? Well, it's very interesting because as um, somebody who works mainly in live performance, uh, these days, everything is suddenly on film. So uh, you really have to suddenly start thinking differently and um, of course, what's dynamic when you can hear somebody breathe and you can see them, as Marie said earlier, in a three dimensional space and they're moving around you or you have a sense of a dynamic and a shift. And there's so many other elements like breath and, you know, just three dimensional live space. And excuse me, this stuff. But um, and so suddenly when you're thinking about film, you have to think about what's not reading because it, uh, it can become very flat on a screen 
also, um, you know, when you're performing on stage, for me, one of the things that was really interesting, the amount of projection, how you project the energy into a room, because you've got somebody sitting right at the back of the theatre. So you've got to project so that everybody in the room is getting the same sense of what you want to convey. Whereas when you have a camera right here on top of you, you have to pull it right back. And so that for me was, that for me during this time in general, but especially because with Marie, I think this has been the first experience of really getting my teeth into that. And for us to work together on that has been a really um, exciting process just to learn to pull back or to learn just what's necessary to, to convey a certain idea. And how, I mean, lots of performers have spoken of, you know, this kind of sacred relationship between the performer and the audience. And it's so, it's in the, in and of the moment and every performance is different depending on the audience. How do you substitute in your head for that? That there isn't an individual audience there that you can see and hear? <laughs> well, there's something that I think I've always worked with, with audience is that you give to them, but at the same stage, at the same time, you, I would treat a person in, I would kind of objectify them, if that's the right word. So the person in the audience gets the same treatment as a tile on the ground or a chair or a wall behind me so that I don't, I'm, although I'm giving the energy to all of those things equally, I don't, it sounds a bit wacky, but there's a reason for it. Um, so that you don't get affected by their emotional state. Because sometimes when you're performing, you could have somebody who's had a really horrible day and they may not want to see this show and they probably haven't fed the cat. And then they're suddenly sitting beside you and they're just like, Pfft. and so when you're performing in front of them, if you open yourself up to that energy, you have to learn how to control it, which doesn't, you know what I mean, where to put a kind of barrier so that you don't, when you're being vulnerable, and especially in this work, there's a lot of vulnerability because you're dealing with a subject matter that's tender and sensitive. So um, with a live audience, you have to kind of protect yourself from that, which on screen you don't have to do as much because you're, you're, you're surrounded by your team who are, you know, all sensitive to the subject matter. And so it's, it can be slightly kind of more freeing in a strange way. Okay. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, Marie, because in the visual arts, my experience anyway would be that we're quite used to being somewhat at a remove. There's a stillness, you know, and the artist generally isn't there. So I just wonder how you feel that this work is now, um, vis-a-vis -vis how it might have been from your visual arts perspective in terms of the audience and their encounter with it. Maybe, maybe that isn't that different in your case, but maybe it is. A lot of the work I'd be doing, you know, in terms of drawing from a, a kind of social arts practice, there'd be um, a lot of um, working behind the scenes um, in a very collaborative way. And then the work's presented to, to a public um, in a way that you, you don't really necessarily have the opportunity to engage with that audience. So I'm very interested in then bringing the audience back in to the work. Um, so it's different. It's a different stage to what you were discussing there with Philip in the sense of um, the moment of creation, the moment of a live event, um, but more so to, I suppose, um, allow different readings and reflections and thinkings to be folded back into the work. I'm really interested in that myself um, and what that then does to the work. So where the work's presented, how the work's spoken about, who contextualises it, how, what, where, how that affects the work. So the work potentially, I think, is interesting to think of it evolving and changing through those different lenses. Um, That's great to just get a sense of the, the, the real internal processes and your own senses of, of what happens next, which is the you know, I think how the audience or the participant experiences it for me, that's always kind of an interesting question. There are so many issues that are care related that, that COVID has really brought, you know, into full daylight. So it's a very, very political issue. I think care, you know, who, who cares, who gets cared for, what does caring say, what does the model of care that we use in Ireland say about our attitude to people? Having said all that, and maybe my last question um, for you, Marie, is just what do you hope that people will have taken from this work ultimately when they when they walk away, I guess? Is there any sense? I mean, you never obviously you don't want to dictate. No one does what 
the message there isn't a message but what do you hope somebody will be feeling or thinking or in some way left with when when they walk away um, I'm really hoping that they'll be left with questions um, and, and I'm really hoping that the work it kind of opens up a space to I suppose explore you know like like in all my work, I'm interested in, in kind of looking at, you know, um, unearthing kind of truths that might otherwise be kind of hidden um, and then bearing the relation to how, how does this impact on, you know, individuals and society? Is it within Ireland? Is it globally? Um, and I think you're, you're exactly right, Tara, in the sense of beknownst us, you know, when the project was started, you know, we didn't know about COVID then, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't on our kind of, you know, even our peripheral vision. Um, and yet then, you know, now the, the ideas that are embedded in this work, so, you know, kind of conceptually thinking about, you know, a person's autonomy and this sense of self-determination and, you know, notions of, as you say, care of the self and others. Um, I think we've all got a really different relationship to some of those questions and thinking now. Um, and so I think the job of the work isn't to give answers, um, it's more to to drill into the, some of the complexities of some of those questions. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, some people would politicise the work and say it's, it's you know, giving voice to kind of the, the marginalised and, you know, some of the carers would and, may, would and some wouldn't agree with that. But, you know, from my perspective, it, it's more to give space to explore some of these complexities and allow space for thinking. Um, and, um, I mean, I, I think... It's, it's been really interesting and, and lovely working with Philip. It's like we've both got experience of kind of being primary carers for someone, for a loved one. And we've both charted very, very different journeys in terms of how to um, manifest that within or without, without, outside of our work. Some of those kind of deep intimacies of, of really raw and challenging kind of, you know, truths that are both, you know, very tender and, and very sensitive and also very hard you know for for um us as a society to come to terms with in terms of because once you've heard those things what what then should be done and then now it folds back into a wider thinking um potentially in terms of people having experience and still living with covid um, and their relationship to self-care and care of neighborhoods and care of society and then care of like our global world you know um there's a lot there specifically about the legislation and what does it mean now it's still been rolled out you know it was signed in a, in you know a number of years ago but still been rolled out so you know to explore the specifics of of some of those um complexities but then also what does it mean for us you know in ireland in society globally some of these issues so that's a long rambling answer Tara. no not at all um i i think it's it's one of those issues that you know many people will end up either being carers or being cared for so it's like whenever we think about these issues it's not just the, the kind of general politics around it um, and there are so many of that in terms of who as I said you know the class issues in terms of who cares for people when it's not family related and the gender issues and all those things but um it's thinking ahead about well how what is the model of care we want for our future as much as what's the model of care I want for my relative right now. Um, so Marie Brett, Philip Connaughton, can I just thank you both um, for talking us through the project today? It was really interesting for me. And yeah, thank you so much for your time and good luck over the next couple of months.